speaker, which is Jen Kaleha. Jen is a poet, a writer, and a translator. She's the translator in residence at the uh, Austrian Cultural Forum, and she writes articles on translation for the Quietus. Uh, she's just published a translation of a German novel with uh, Fitzcarraldo Press, and has another coming out with Perrine Press soon. So please, a round of applause for Jen Kaleha. Thank you very much to Stephen for asking me to come and speak. Um, this is really amazing to be here. Um, as Stephen said, I'm a, I'm a translator and an editor and a curator. And I'm in residence at the Austrian Cultural Forum. Um, and everything I pretty much do in my day-to-day -day life is try and make literary translation as accessible as possible. So um, I'm going to try and convince you that you are all translators and I'm not a specialist in any kind of shape or form. Um, everybody translates constantly every day, um, be it the kind of internal subconscious thoughts that you've got in your mind where you have an internal conversation with yourself that you know you won't have to communicate on the outside, so where you already kind of know your train of thought and there's information that you know you won't have to communicate and therefore um, your internal monologue um, is fractured and abstract and then you have to then externalise that into a social environment which will then change what you've been thinking into a space where you have to think about who you'll, you'll offend if you're going to be understood um, but also making these abstract thoughts into something that's a, that's a chain, that's an external communication. Um, when I say I want translation to be accessible it's because more people should be translators and I think there's a real fear of um, foreign language um, and translation itself and there's still a lot of mistrust around what happens in translation. So what I'm going to focus on is poetry and translation. Um, I've translated some poetry but predominantly I'm a translator from children's fiction, non-fiction, uh, non-fiction academic essays um, and fiction. Um, again going back to how we are all translators I mean, on a daily basis, someone might say, can you rephrase that, or have you got another word for that? I don't know that word. And that is a form of translation, and it's predominantly a very human thing to do. You are constantly having to shift the way that you're personally communicating to change it for somebody else so that they understand. And this is something we do, you know, without really thinking. And what I would suggest to you is if you only speak one language, which is actually on a global scale, very uncommon. Um, globally, uh, you know, being bilingual or multilingual is actually the norm, and being monolingual is unusual. Um, I would suggest that you don't think of languages as two separate parts, and you're transferring from one language into another. I personally experience translation, and today I'm only really talking about my own personal experience in translation, is I would suggest that thinking of um, two languages, three languages, however many languages you have, um, on a spectrum of choice. So, for instance, when I visualise words in my head, when I'm translating from German into English, if I have a word, say, like, friend, um, I imagine all the different words in English we have for friend. So we have friend, mate, chum, pal. And then this continues into a spectrum of German words. So. Freund, Bekannte, Alte, Freundin. Um, and so I don't really consider when I'm translating that I'm translating from one language into another. I see it very similar to when I'm writing poetry or writing fiction. I have uh, one option and then I'm turning it into another option, be it from German to English or English into English. Um, I also, in my day-to-day -day life, um, as well as trying to make translation seem as normal as possible, and I really hope there are questions um, after my talk. Um, I also try and bring the human being back into translation. So historically, um, there's been a general misunderstanding of what translation is, that it's basically copying uh, from one language just into English. And uh, I still get asked by editors or when I'm given translation jobs, I'm told, just write it out into English or um, just type, type it up into English. And that's not really 
how it works. Word for word translation is a myth that doesn't exist and every language is completely different. Um, Jacques Derrida, the philosopher, came up with an equation which is S, S equals P. So in, in translation, although it shouldn't really exist, it does exist. And S and P are two foreign languages, but in the instance of translation, they are equal. In translation, we talk about equivalence. So um, if I were to literally translate a sentence from German into English, the grammar would be completely different. Um, and every word, although it will have an equivalent in English, there isn't one equivalent, there are multiple equivalents. So because um, a German sentence of poetry will be different, will be translated differently by every individual, um, it means that although there is one original text, original line from an original text, there could be a hundred different translations depending on who is translating that sentence. Um, I, as part of my residency at the Austrian Cultural Forum, I curated an exhibition where I asked a range of artists, um, filmmakers, musicians to do um, inter-semiotic translations of a short story that I translated um, by an Austrian author called Anna Weidenholzer. And these translations were a way of um, illustrating that the translator is an individual with an individual voice. Um, and this isn't a conscious thing. Translating is like reading, like any other person would do, even if you didn't have another language. Every time somebody reads a poem, you will have a different reading to your neighbour, and this is exactly what's happening in translation. Um, it doesn't mean that this is a conscious effort to put yourself into the translation. It is, it's a very much a subconscious thing, depending on who you are as an individual. I saw an argument yesterday online between two translators, one translator, saying um, a translator should really um, celebrate their own individuality, celebrate your own vocabulary, um, realise that you have a voice and you should use it to make a translation as alive as possible. And another translator called him a narcissist and said that he didn't feel the compulsion to have himself in his translations. And I think this is very interesting uh, because it presupposes that you can remove yourself from your translation. Um, translators, like I say, have been considered as kind of copiers um, that you're almost photocopying a, um, a foreign text into English. But really, we're human. Um, we have our own kind of ideological or sociocultural differences. So, for instance, it's quite well known that Simone de Beauvoir's translator that translated the second sex wasn't a feminist, didn't understand existentialism. So his translation was, was completely flawed. Maybe on a linguistic level, it was correct, but by him not having the same trains of thought and not having those ideological similarities with Simone de Beauvoir basically meant that the translation didn't communicate what it should do. And I would put forward this argument in terms of, you know, a translator will, will create a different text depending on their, you know, if they're working class, um, depending on their race, um, any kind of life experience, because um, basically we're all individual writers, individually writing different texts, um, and you can't really remove yourself from that process. Um, I think one of the reasons why people still are a bit worried about translation is there's a fear that you're, you're losing something. Um, that the translators being dishonest and not bringing over everything that they could do. Um, there's a really good quote by David Bellos. Um, he's got this amazing book called Is That a Fish in Your Ear? And it's probably one of the best books you can get on translation. Um, and he talks about um, the philosopher Gerald Katz's axiom of effability. And this is the quote from David Bellos, which is, translation presupposes not the loss of the ineffable in any given act of interlingual med mediation, such as the translation of poetry, but the irrelevance of the ineffable to acts of communication. And what this is basically saying is um, that anything that can't be translated isn't necessary in the communication of what the poem or the text is trying to get across. So the, the difference between the original text and the translation is obviously that they are totally different texts. The new poem 
or the, sorry, the translation of the original text is a new poem and should be considered that way. And that's my opinion. There are different schools of thought that believe that um, that you know the translation shouldn't be a new poem. You should be able to know it's a translation based on the text itself. That you should keep grammatical flow. That you should even keep some of the foreign words. Um, but basically, I believe that would create an archive or a shadow of the original poem, but it wouldn't be a living poem that people would actually want to read. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I'm kind of talking about my own experience of translating, and not everyone would really agree with that. Um, yeah, and basically I'd like to read a poem from my book, which is about translation, which is almost a translation of this talk. Um, and, yeah, I look forward to any questions. I find that I can respond better than kind of talking off the cuff, but I'd like to read this poem to you. Um, it's called She Is That Which I Are, and it's in reference to a German poet called Barbara Köhler, who wrote um, Niemann's Frau, which was a kind of German feminist rendition of the Odyssey. Um, basically, I don't know if you know German, the word for he is er, E-R, but the word for she is Z, which is S-I-E, but that word also means you, as in the polite version of you, also means they, can mean them. Um, so whereas the kind of male pronoun is a standalone element in itself, the, the female pronoun always has to be in context for you to really understand who's being talked about. Um, so hence the title, she is that which I are. Um, it's also written after the poet Durst Grunwein, who is originally from Dresden, and a lot of his poetry talks about the destruction of Dresden, um, and one of the lines of one of his poems is when he was accused at a reading of, um, of not really having a right to talk about Dresden because he wasn't actually alive at the time of the bombings, you know, it was, he's a post-war poet, and someone said to him, what do you know about it, you weren't even there? And I think that's quite an interesting kind of parallel with the translator, because translators are creating texts after the fact. We're talking about experiences that we haven't ourselves experienced, but that we still feel very deep connection with the stories that we're telling. Um, and the whole reason I became a translator, I didn't study German, I just read a lot of German books, and I managed to get to a good enough standard that I could then become a translator. And the way it happened for me was I was reading an amazing book, and I felt very frustrated because it was so wonderful. I wanted to share it, and I couldn't because it didn't exist in English, so I started live translating from this book. And I realized that being, being a translator is being a storyteller has a very human aspect to it. Um, and I love translating live German and Austrian and Swiss poets because you form a friendship and a dialogue with those people and you're sharing those stories. Um, they may not be perfect linguistic renditions, but um, as I learned today, um, if you call someone a gorsa tor, which the literal translation is a big door, um, that actually means a big idiot in German. So the linguistic is only one level. Um, you can't translate and carry over everything on the linguistic level. You have to make changes for things to be understood. But I'd like to redo this point. This map is encrypted and to take one path sets the route in motion. We've been playing Chinese whispers, I've been following your gestures, the way you move your fingers interests me. No one else has noticed they have a different focus, your face, your mind, notes that you published in the spring. Our meetings are clandestine, we bemoan our own egos, it may well be that we enjoy the attention, a hype celebrity playing the best light role. I can play the part like an actor, see a play in the dark and adapt it for a stage, dim or bright. I play different notes, but in the right order, where before you had the verdict or the answer, I can provide the equations, the results of my game of multiple choice. I heard a funny story and I'm dying to tell it. I'm your personal messaging service. Would you like me to filter today's news? My phone rings again. I take another call. He tells me something's troubling him. I dismiss it as unimportant. He asks me to make a note, but I've never been good at taking dictation. I live off of disintegration. Auf jeder neuen Form liegt schon der Schatten der Zerstörung. Behind every new form already lies the shadow of destruction. How afraid are no end formal eats, sure dares chatter us, sir, still wrong. 
I walk through the woods and through a clearing as I observe my, observe my surroundings. I step into a car park, I maneuver a car park, I traverse a car park. The traffic sounds steer me across the high street on the diagonal. I cut the corner to the park and allow myself some seeing. I come to an isolated factory, disused with a distorted structure. I remember the night shifts stirring, stirring, making checks and kicking back for naps. I'd eat from the pots with a long spoon, the melting components. I couldn't afford the canteen lunch. It was a story my friend enjoyed telling, the way only he can. It popped up in a graphic novel, brown and green and grey. And though I never felt that way, it really is what happened. The story became a screenplay, then came a movie with a slew of reviews, which shared the same specific line, misquoted, that became a rally slogan or nothing at all. Leaning back to keep my balance, I slip down the quarry bank and stumble in a wave of stones, or on a mound of stones, or a patch of loose rock to the slash close to the shore. I answer my phone and describe my situation. I'm just down and right from the factory. I hear him relay this to a friend. She's in the quarry right at the other end. No, I say I'm only on the beach. That's what I said, he says. I progress in the wind, not just for mild slash melancholy slash nondescript weather. I go under the rock arch and across the fresh mud to the bank that leads slash heads up slash above the lighthouse to the bed and breakfast. In the sitting room behind the bar, I find an old video cassette and play it over and over. The sound was gone, but I could half remember what they used to say. I narrate and everyone laughs. No one minds or knows that it wasn't a comedy. After a drink, I head out across the meadow that sashays and whispers about fish and cars and windows. That same meadow that you wrote says nothing but just hums peacefully when we all filled out the conservation forms. They chose yours as exemplary and chucked the other 50. Unzerstorbarkeit der menschlichen Seele, the indestructibility of the human soul. Unsure, tall, bike, bar, right, dan, men, leash, and sailor. You would slash might say only over the hill, I may say just over, they might say all the way over. At the start, we simply knew it was a hill. When one thinks of a hill, one thinks of all hills. One remembers all hills. Even if this walk's been mapped a thousand times, it can take a thousand times more. Before and during the final cliff crumbles into the sea. The sea will forever be the trope, and this time I'll tell you what I thought of it. There goes my phone again. I write everything down, but it's less him. It's standardised slash personalised somehow. What do I know? What do I care? I wasn't even there. Thank you very much. We have time for a question or two, quickly, for Jen. And this gentleman here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a poet myself, <coughs> so uh, biographer and translator of the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. And um, I totally agree with you that translation should not be mere copies. I think you used the word shadows in it. I like that. I uh, agree totally. Funnily enough, Neruda told interviews that he, he his preferred language for uh, translations of his poetry is Spanish. Uh, it's Italian, from Spanish into Italian because he, he thought that the, the rhythm and the vowels structure was similar. I totally disagree with Neruda about his own poetry, <laughs> because uh, that actually it turns into it's more like a Xerox. The, the Italian translations of Neruda are, don't do anything different. They hardly change the originals. I think the English translations are much more produce a much more interesting version. I suppose because the musicality is almost like a trap. It must be quite stifling when there's such you have similar to, uh, language. Well, no, 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 since this is a, um, a, a session on neuroscience, um, Neruda, the fascinating thing about Neruda is, although every line of his is, 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 it makes music, it's beautiful music in Spanish, uh, he had no ear for music himself. He, he got bored listening to music. He had a musia. But, um, but which, when you translate, even in a language like English, which is very different from Spanish, you have to capture the music. So I, I, that's a challenge to translate in English. You have to capture the musicality but using very different vowel sounds. And so it's the same with a lot of German, isn't it? The English, some of the English is very similar to German, a lot of it is too. Yeah, I think, as you probably know, in translation, you have the false friends syndrome, mm -hmm. where a lot of German and English words appear very similar, but actually the connotations and the meanings are very different. Um, so it, it can be quite tempting to just kind of match those very similar words and think that they mean the same thing. But 
but in terms of you know, German rhythm, obviously the word order is completely different, but if you translated German very literally, it would sound almost like archaic English, which would create the completely wrong feel, because the word order um, does sound like an oldie English, even very contemporary German poetry, so that's why you can't keep the, the literal um, kind of flow of German. No, I can just just find it just very quickly. Please. The, the, um, on the musicality, I mean, you've got to move. You've got, uh, literal translations are hopeless. Uh, they're I, good. I, they're I, good for like an edu for education purposes. Oh, oh, of course. The literal, of linguistic. Course. Yeah. Before you move on to the next step, mm -hmm. but um, you have to change. The, you have to produce a new poem. The translator has to produce a new poem, which reads like the new, uh, read well in the in the language you're translating into. And, that's, and that sometimes means you do have to change the, the structure quite a lot, especially in a uh, 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 who can be deceptively simple but also quite hermetic some of his poetry. So you have to uh, uh, restructure, re, uh, change the, 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 the style but not the meaning, because there are some translators of Nerula who are poets and they, complete, they completely go off on a tangent and completely alter the meaning it makes a beautiful line, but it doesn't mean anything like the original poem. It means that's, that's going too far, so I think, yeah, I think the balance between um, the two is very important. Yeah, and it's very difficult to have. Um, I always find if you find a rhyming translation, that that means that the, the contents would have been dramatically changed, whereas if you have a non-rhyming or kind of, even if the original poem rhymed or had a strong musicality, the, the, then the transfer of meaning would have been dramatically altered if it then in the new poem there is this um, kind of syllable match or rhyme. Sure, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. A round of applause for Jane Clayton.